our study tonight in Nehemiah chapter 11 with the title of the message of Where Are You Dwelling? Where are you dwelling? In Nehemiah chapter 11, let's open up with prayer. Father, your word to us is given here tonight. We understand that you've revealed things to us so that we can know you, so that we can understand you and understand your ways and your dealings with men. And as we're told in the New Testament that these things are written for our learning so that we can grow, so that we can understand more of how you would have us to live in this world and what we need and the essentials of our faith and what it is to be set apart for you. Lord, we pray that you'd use this time tonight, that you'd speak to us, that you would allow us to hear from you so that we might leave this place changed, so that we might be impacted for all eternity as we're here in this place. Lord, speak to our hearts, minister to us as we minister to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So where are you dwelling? We've come to the final section in the book of Nehemiah here in the Old Testament. In the last three chapters, we have seen revival in God's people take place. It began in chapter 8 with revival in God's word. Of course, we saw that passage there in Nehemiah chapter 8, verse 8, how that Ezra stood up, the priests stood up before the people, and they read out of the book the law of God, and they caused the people to understand and to give them the sense and the understanding of the meaning of those things. And revival came out as a result of that. In chapter 8, the word of God was taught to the people. The people became aware of their condition before the Lord. And that's what the word of God does. It cuts right into our heart. It speaks to us. And it brings about what we see in Nehemiah chapter 9, which is confession. The people of God recognized their condition. They were moved by the word of God. And it prompted them to confess and much like how the Holy Spirit works in us today, he does that very same thing. We recognize who God is and all that he has done, and we realize our sin. And confession always precedes repentance, which is to turn, of course, from our sin to God. And that is what we saw in Nehemiah chapter 10. The people were so convicted by their condition before God, that they were prompted to action. They sealed that covenant before the Lord. They committed themselves to be separate from the world, to be separated unto God, consecrated to him. And now in Nehemiah chapter 11, we're brought to the need for populating the city of Jerusalem. The wall of Jerusalem had been rebuilt, but the city was sparsely populated. There was hardly anybody living in it. Much of it was still in ruins. They had built the wall around it, but now they had to build even more inside and to protect that which they had done. Nehemiah had come for that very purpose, rebuilding the wall of Jerusalem. But now it was time to restore worship. Many of the people were living in various towns and villages around the city of Jerusalem, but now there was a need to have the people move in. And we really look tonight at the city of Jerusalem as being like the church. In the sense of God's people being close to God in the place where God would have us as part of the body of Christ. And in Nehemiah chapter 11, verse 1, we read, Now the leaders of the people dwelt at Jerusalem. The rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to dwell in Jerusalem, the holy city, and nine-tenths were to dwell in other cities. And so as we saw with the sealing of the covenant, the leaders were leading by example. This is always the way it should be. Leaders are to set the pace the purpose of Nehemiah coming to Jerusalem, of course, as we said, was to rebuild the wall. But now that the wall had been rebuilt, his job was done. But notice how he left the state of the nation. The leaders here had caught that same vision. They had that same desire. They'd come alongside Nehemiah to accomplish that work of restoration, but the work didn't stop there for the people. There was more to be done. The walls were up, but the city needed work. And the leaders had a work to do. And this is always a need that we have in the church. There is a need for leaders within the church. And God is calling all of us, every single one of us, to be a leader in his church. Leaders for the people to follow and learn from. Those who will rise up and be an example for others to follow. You know, every single one of us, no matter how long you've been walking with the Lord, there is somebody that you can pour into. There is somebody that you can disciple. There's somebody that you can minister to and lead them by example. 
Because I can guarantee every single one of us at some point, we were a new believer and we came into the church wondering, how do I do this? How do I actually live as a man of God? How do I lead my family? What does that look like? How do I witness at my workplace? How do I serve the Lord? And that is what God is calling each of us to do as leaders. There's a time to sit and observe and grow, but then there's a time for us to rise up and lead and to respond to the call that God has for all of us. And there's a significant difference between those who lead and those who just sort of meander along. Those who are just kind of going with the flow, the years go by and they're just kind of following along. They're not really doing anything significant with their life. But why is that? Why is it that most people will never rise to the call of leadership? Why is it that in most families, the men are the last to lead their families in devotions or family prayer time? Nehemiah divides the people into two groups here, the leaders and the rest of the people. What kind of man do you want to be? Do you want to just go with the flow and take a back seat in your walk with Christ? Or do you want to be a follower of Christ as a leader? Why would we want to be a leader? That is what Christ was. That is what Jesus said to his disciples, follow me. Follow me. Watch my example. Do as I do. Why is it that so many of us are content to follow, but only at a distance? Well, I'll follow if it's convenient for me. I'll follow if I have time to do it. Or I'll lead if it's maybe for something that's really not going to be that difficult for me to do. Because it might be hard for me. But notice here that the rest of the people apparently didn't really want to live in Jerusalem. Why would that be? The walls were rebuilt. But the city was still in ruins, and the temple was rebuilt, but the city itself was still in need of work. There would have been extremely difficult, hard work that needed to be done. And that's often the case in the church. It's often the case that the work is hard, and it would have been dangerous. They were a target of the enemies. We remember from the beginning of the time that they began the work of rebuilding the walls that they were under attack. They were being oppressed by their enemies on every angle. That's why they were building with a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other, trying to complete the work that God had called them to do. They had the wall, but still only few people were willing to defend that city. And most of the people were quite content to live out in their own land, to stay at home and do their own thing, perhaps. Yes, they would come on the day of worship when it was worship day. We'll come into the city and we'll worship God, but then we'll go back to our own lives the rest of the week. Perhaps there's many people that don't want to give up that lifestyle. And so many Christians are like that today. They don't want to give themselves to God fully. They'll be willing to give themselves to the Lord as long as it's convenient for my life. But if it's inconvenient, well, maybe I'm not available today. Maybe I'm not available to do what is necessary and what's being called for, what's being asked of me to do. And this is so true in ministry today. There's many people who are content to just come to church on Sunday, but that's it. And so few people actually will rise up and serve, that will rise up and build. They wouldn't dream of giving up their lifestyle and committing to regularly serving, committing to something. That's almost like a forbidden word for men, commitment. <laughs> I don't know about that. You know, if I can make it, I'll make it. I'll let you know five minutes away. <laughs> if I'm in the parking lot, I'll be here. We don't want to commit. And so here we find the people cast lots to determine who would move into the city. And casting lots was something that was common back in those days, in the ancient times. It was similar to perhaps something like drawing straws. If you have a stack of straws and you put them in your hand and whoever draws out the shortest straw, they're the winner or the loser, depending on your perspective. Or like casting dice, the highest roll wins. That was kind of the idea. And God's people would often use this to determine the will of the Lord. So tonight we're going to cast lots at the end of our study and we're going to determine where you're going to serve in the ministry. Maybe it's going to be in the children's ministry. Maybe it's going to be in the parking lot. Maybe it'll be security. No, we won't do that. If that sounds scary to you, <laughs> pray about that. Ask the Lord to give you a heart for what he wants you to do. Of course, that's not something that we do around here. Of course, we have the benefit of the Holy Spirit. 
The Holy Spirit shows us and calls us and incentivizes us and motivates us to serve him. He is the one who guides us into the truth and he is the one who directs our steps as we yield ourselves to God. If you don't have a desire to serve the Lord, if you don't have a desire to give of yourself to the Lord, you have to ask yourself, what have I not yielded in my life to the Lord? What am I holding on to that's holding me back? And so we rely on the Holy Spirit to move God's people to service. The last thing that we want is for people to be serving in the church that don't want to be here. Begrudgingly, don't ever do anything out of constraint or compulsion because somebody made you to do it. If you're here and you don't want to be here, don't serve. But at the same time, ask God to change your heart. Ask God to give you the desire to serve. And guess what? He will. He will do that. And so this is how they determined who would live in the city. It might seem random, but it seems also that God's hand was upon it as well. We might think sometimes, especially as God's people, we're just, we're just walking by chance. I don't really know what's going to happen. I just kind of put it out there and we'll see what happens. Roll the dice and see what the Lord does. God is in that. If you're seeking to serve the Lord, you're seeking to trust in him with all of your heart and not lean on your own understanding, but in all of your ways acknowledge him, he will direct your path. God will lead you, whatever you do. If you roll dice, you cast lots, God will be the one to orchestrate your steps and where you go. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, the Bible says. And so it might seem random, but for those who were going to live in Jerusalem, it meant that they were going to be in the center of worship. And if we look at that and as it relates to the church, we see the same thing. Jerusalem was the holy city. It was the temple of God. It was where the temple was, that God had placed his name there. It was the place that God had chosen for himself. And to dwell there meant that the people were to be wholly given to a life serving the Lord, giving themselves entirely over to the Lord. Most of the people were unwilling to make such a commitment and that's true today. Most people are, are willing to go a certain amount, but I don't want to go all the way. But they are the ones who are missing out on the best thing that could ever happen in their life. And the interesting thing about giving something up in my life for the Lord is that he takes note. He sees when I do that. He sees when I give him something, I'm willing to do something for him, and it doesn't go unrewarded. God will always be faithful to reward those who will give to him sacrificially. Whatever I give to the Lord, he always gives me so much more in return. In reality, those who give themselves to a life of ministry have a special blessing of being close to the Lord. Serving the Lord, following him, walking alongside of him, you'll experience a satisfying and fulfilling life that you would never experience otherwise. That's why God calls us. He calls us to ministry. Living in Jerusalem meant constantly being around God's servants. It meant constantly being around people who were doing God's work. Yes, it would be a sacrifice. Yes, it would be tiring. But it would be a constant reminder of God's purpose for their life. It would be a constant reminder of the presence of God. And that's what it is. When we serve the Lord, when we make ourselves available to God in the place of the body, we're aware of those things. We're encouraged by one another and we're aware of the presence of God because we're reminded every moment, I am doing this for my king. I am doing this for the Lord. And remember, the purpose of the wall was twofold. First, it was to protect God's people from attacks from without, but it was also to protect God's people and to keep them safe from wandering outside into the world. And many people come to church on Sunday, they believe that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior. They've given their life to the Lord. They've made that profession of faith. They've turned away from believing in the false teachings of the world and those things that have drawn them away in the past. And they've given themselves to the Lord in that sense, but yet they've held on to something. They've never gone beyond that. There's something that happens in their life because sin is taking hold. They've made that confession, but they just can't seem to get their lives together. What is it? What is it that's holding them back? Why can't they break through? Why are they stuck and caught up in bondage, drugs, 
alcohol, pornography, on and on and on the list goes. But I'm a believer, they say. Why is it that I can't break free from this? They're living outside the walls of the church. One of the benefits of living inside the walls of the church is accountability. If you make yourself available to the church, all of a sudden you make yourself accountable. What does that mean? You can't just go and hide in the darkness anymore. Something has happened. And if you're struggling with something in your life tonight, here's what you need to do. Move into the holy city. Move in. Take advantage of every opportunity to be here. If you think that you can make it on your own outside the walls, you are wrong. The devil wants you to think that you can do that, but that is a lie. So many people live lives that are falling apart, and they think that coming to church once in a while and perhaps reading their Bible sometimes and praying every once in a while is enough. But they're dwelling outside the holy city. They don't realize it. Church isn't intended to be an option when it's convenient for me. The more that I'm here, the more accountability there is. People are going to ask me how I'm doing. Where have you been for the last week? I haven't seen you. There's accountability. If I'm struggling with something, I can have a brother pray for me. I can build that accountability. Not to mention I'm being accountable before the Lord. I'm listening to him as his word is being taught. I'm around people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. I'm in a place where I'm being influenced to live a holy life set apart from God. You're not going to get that out in the world. You're not going to get that going outside the walls, doing your own thing. You might think you're making it okay, but that is exactly why so many people keep at a distance. Accountability is good, but it can be awfully painful, especially if you are caught up in sin. But it is essential. We need it. It's healthy. It's for our good. It's pretty hard to live in sin when you come into fellowship with other brothers and all of a sudden act like there's nothing wrong. How are you doing? I'm doing great. <laughs> you know what you did that day. You know what's been going on in your life. You'll be miserable. And that's why so many people break fellowship. That's why we see so many people walk away from the Lord. They walk away from the church because they're impacted. They're convicted. That accountability, I can't handle that. It's a good thing. We need it. Those that reject and walk away from fellowship are running from the conviction of the Holy Spirit in their lives. If you are struggling with some sin in your life tonight, or you know someone who is, listen. Move into the holy city. You can't actually live here, but we make every opportunity available for you to be here. We have things available for this body almost every day of the week. Start coming here more than you go anywhere else. If you want to see God do a work in your life, be here. Sunday morning, Tuesday morning for men's prayer, Tuesday nights you're here, Wednesday nights for Bible study, Thursday nights we've got our one-step ministry, Friday nights we usually have events for young couples, we have married fellowship events going on, we have all kinds of things, and this is what we are here for as a church. This Saturday we have our Transform Men's Conference. Men, we need to be here. We need to come. If you want to experience transformation in your life, start making church your home. Make it your priority. Discover your gifts of the Spirit in the church, and this is what God has called us for in the church, to do that. Dwell within the walls. Verse 2, And the people blessed all the men who willingly offered themselves to dwell at Jerusalem. Here is some wonderful encouragement from the people. They might not actually want to dwell in Jerusalem themselves, but they blessed those who willingly did so. They offered themselves to do so, and they were blessed. And God does the same for us. God will never force you to do something that you don't want to do. He'll never make me or make you sign up to serve in some capacity. He won't make you go and teach in the children's ministry. You don't want to do that? He's not going to make you do that. He'll never make you show up for a men's prayer meeting, but he'll bless you when you do, and you'll experience that. God's people will bless you when you do. If you give to the Lord, you will be blessed. And ultimately, that's what worship is, giving to the Lord. Giving him glory, giving him praise, giving him adoration, giving him myself. As Paul says in Romans 12, as a living sacrifice. Holy 
acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, giving myself to the Lord. We often think worship is that time of music and singing before the study starts, the time that we can wander in and hopefully nobody will notice we came late because it's still just kind of starting, right? The warm up. <laughs> well, that's part of it, not the late part, but that's part of it, part of the worship. But really, worship is manifested in many ways. It's how I live. I heard the story of a, a poor old Indian man who came into a small country church one day, and he was so moved by the service and the words that were spoken that he wanted to give something to the Lord. And at the end of the service, when the offering plate was being passed around, the usher came and stood next to him, and this old man said, can you hold it lower? And so the usher lowered the plate, and he said, can you lower it a little bit more? And he lowered it a little bit more. He said, lower. All right, lower it a bit more. He said, lower. Next thing you know, the plate is sitting on the floor. This old Indian poor man stood up and he stepped right into the plate. He got it. That was the idea. He didn't have anything to give, but he recognized what the most important thing to give the Lord was. Give himself. That's what God wants from us. God wants us to give ourselves willingly, those who willingly offer themselves for him. That is a sweet-smelling aroma. That is a sacrifice well-pleasing to God. Verse 3, but these are the heads of the province who dwelt in Jerusalem, but in the cities of Judah, everyone dwelt in his own possession in their cities, Israelites, priests, Levites, Nethanim, and descendants of Solomon's servants. So from here now through verse 24, we're given a list of all these leaders and the heads of the families who dwelt in Jerusalem, each name recorded and identified with the jobs that they had to do. And all of them were important. Some were chief officers. Some were overseers of workers. Some were supervisors in the temple. Some were just workers, both inside the temple and outside the temple. Some were gatekeepers. They were securing the entrance, watching over those who were coming in and those who were going out all working together in unity. And it is a blessing to see God's people come together and fulfill the purpose in the work of the Lord within the church. That is something to behold. And those who do know what it is, they understand. They get it. This is one of the great purposes of the church. It's a place for God's people to come together and serve together. And everyone has a purpose. Everyone has a place to serve. All are important. You know, we sometimes have a tendency to look at ministries and things that other people are doing, and we can kind of get envious. Well, I could do that, and I'm, I could do better than that person. And we have this idea that, just like in the world, we should be able to do something better, or there's something else that we should be doing because we deserve it. But God has a purpose in each one of those positions, each one of those roles that we have. My job, your job, is just to be faithful with what God has put before us. Be faithful in that, and if you have a desire for another position, be faithful in the one that you were in, and God will test you. God will prove you in that before he then puts you in a position that you may have a desire for. That's a good thing to have a desire for something that you're not doing, perhaps, that you want to do. Paul said in writing to Timothy, he who desires the office of a bishop desires a good thing. An overseer, a leader, a pastor, if you have that desire, that's a good thing. It's not a bad thing to desire something good to serve the Lord with, but be faithful with what God has done by giving you the place where you have. It doesn't mean that one position is lesser than another. Paul addressed this very thing in Corinthians, in 1 Corinthians. If you want to turn there, we're going to look at that passage Briefly, we're going to read through that section in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul is talking about the body of Christ, the members of the body. That is us. We make up the church. We make up the members of Christ's body. He is the head of the church. We are his instruments or we are his members within the body, all working together to accomplish the purposes that he has for us. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 12 begins here. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, 
and have all been made to drink into one spirit. For in fact, the body is not one member, but many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Rhetorical question. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? Verse 17, if the whole body were an eye, where would be the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now, indeed, there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which were, we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty, but our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given greater honor to that part which lacks it, that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another." And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. So we're all members of the same body, yet we all have a different function. God has something different, unique for each and every one of us. We just have to rise up and respond to that calling. So the way that we do that is through submission to God, through obedience to him. And here we find the leaders recognized their calling and they led the way. They were willing to dwell in Jerusalem. The rest of the people cast lots to bring one out of ten to go and dwell in the city. Some had chosen to offer themselves to live in the city, to dwell there freely. But what we see in the remainder of this chapter is those who lived outside the holy city of Jerusalem in verses 25 through 26. We aren't told that they were rebellious or apostate. It wasn't necessarily a bad thing that they were living outside the city, but it would seem that it wasn't the best either. Their names aren't listed here, only the cities that were inhabited. There wasn't anything commendable about their decision. They simply chose not to live within the walls. And as we've seen already, they would ultimately be susceptible and more influenced by the world than the people of God. Yes, they were part of the rebuilding project, but they were more content to just go back and dwell in their own homes afterwards, to tend to their own houses, to take care of the things that they had in their own life. And that can be a dangerous thing to do. But where are you dwelling tonight? Are you dwelling within the walls of God's protection? Are you willing to freely offer yourself to the Lord, it can and will be the best thing that you can do. Don't miss out on what God has for you. If your life is falling apart, move into the city of God. Be here. Spend your time here. Make this a priority. Make everything else secondary and be in the place where you can experience what God wants to do in your life. Surround yourself with God's people. Find protection within the walls of the house of God. Spend time in the place of worship where God's presence is and you will find that God will do great things in your life. He will do the impossible that you cannot do. He will deliver you. He will provide for you. He will protect you. He will transform you by the renewing of your mind because you're putting him first. You're prioritizing the body of Christ and you're making that the most important thing in your life. And God will do what you cannot do. Let's pray. Father, we thank you again for this message that you've given to us out of your word. Lord, we pray that you'd use it in each of our lives. We pray that you would stir us up to love and to good works and to want to know what you have for us to do, to have a desire to be in your presence, to worship you with our lives, to give of ourselves to you as a living sacrifice, to serve you and to allow you to conform us into your image. Lord, we pray that you would influence us by your Holy Spirit. We pray that you'd use these things tonight in our lives, not only in the time that we have now in our discussion groups, but then also, Lord, in our lives personally as we leave this place tonight, Lord, that we would be godly men, that we would be men who fear you, we would be men who lead our wives, that we would be men who lead our families, that we would be men who lead in the body of Christ, that we would find opportunities and ways that we can 
glorify you with who we are so that we can hear those words one day when we stand before you, well done, good and faithful servant. So, Father, we commit the rest of this evening into your hands. We thank you for what you have in store for us yet, and we commit it all to you now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. We'll see you next week.